Hey everyone, I am Steve from GamersNexus.net and today we're looking at Intel's new Skylake platform and the codename Skylake CPUs. This includes the Core i7-6700K and the Core i5-6600K, which take on more familiar naming to the older generations. Intel has presently dropped the XX70 branding, as in the 4770K, and the 6700K is effectively the replacement to the 4790K, the Devil's Canyon chip, which was a, an overclocked replacement to the 4770K. Now, in between those was another chip called Haswell Refresh. So, Intel released three different versions of Haswell with similar SKUs for the last two years or so. And this is very uncharacteristic of Intel. They generally sort of put out their top of the line flagship for any particular architecture, in this case Haswell, and then they just let it sit. They put out a couple of i3s, i5s in between. They might put out a new E platform like Haswell E, Ivy Bridge E, so forth. But this time there were two refreshes in between, Haswell Refresh and Devil's Canyon, and then there's the shift to Skylake architecture. So this is the new architecture. And also uncharacteristic of Intel and somewhat odd for the industry is the coinciding release of Broadwell, which has been discussed for quite a while now, a number of years, and that's finally here as well. But today we're looking at Skylake, the more interesting platform in my opinion. Skylake has DDR4 and DDR3 support, and this is something that until this point has only been offered on x99 platforms. So DDR4 may feel a little bit stale for this reason because it's been around now, it's in x99, but this is actually an important advancement for Intel on the consumer side because Skylake is a little bit more affordable than the X99 offerings, including the $500 and $1,000 CPUs, the 5930K, 5960X. So with Skylake, the memory capabilities include both DDR3L and DDR4. That means that at the motherboard manufacturer's discretion, they may choose one of those two platforms for memory and put it on the board. Our board used DDR4, there are DDR3L boards out there as well, and those will bring costs down considerably for users who are considering the option of Skylake CPUs. So let's go through the specs of the i7-6700K and i5-6600K before we get into the gaming benchmarks. The core and thread count is the same as previously. You've got four cores, eight threads for the 6700K. That means it is hyper-threaded, and the 6600K has four cores, four threads, so it is not hyper-threaded. The 6700K is clocked at 4 gigahertz, and the 6600K clocked at 3.5 gigahertz. Pretty familiar to the 4770 and 4670. And then, uh, of course, the X90 versions of those Devil's Canyon were clocked a little bit higher, so there is more of a gain there, less of a difference between Skylake and DC than Skylake and Haswell. The IGP is the HD530, something we haven't yet tested. I will be doing a separate article and video on that when we have the graphics drivers properly installed. They were not installed in time for launch, unfortunately, but it is the HD 530. And then the TDP is slightly increased over Haswell Base at 91 watts. So very minor increase, but this is in step with Devil's Canyon. And it basically means that there's more juice provided to allow for the higher clock rate, which is what we see in Skylake. So the new chipset for the Skylake platform is Z170. There will very likely be more chipsets. There's normally an H series, there are normally other Z series options as well as the device and platform and everything matures. But right now it's Z170 and that's what we tested on. Z170 has a couple of major additions. Again, the first big item on note for the architecture of the CPU and the support of the chipset is DDR4 memory and this has a hidden cost to it. So although the CPUs are priced very similarly to what they were in the past for their succeeded SKUs, the added cost of DDR4 can drive the price of a build up considerably depending on what you're building and and how much you're looking to spend on your memory. The next biggest change for Z170 is the increase in PCI Express lanes. So Z170 plus Skylake offers a total of 36 PCIe lanes, those are all 3.0, and to put things into perspective, the previous Haswell offerings with the Z97, Z87 chipsets were limited to just 24 lanes, and some of those were PCIe Gen 2. So this is actually a pretty big deal because at 24 lanes, you can't get a full dual GPU by 16 setup going. Now, 
for things we'll discuss in future videos, that's not super relevant because the GPUs really won't saturate that full bandwidth anyway. They'll be just fine at by eight, but you can't get the dual by 16s. And perhaps more relevant is uh, a dual GPU setup plus an SSD using a PCIe slot or PCIe lanes, which is done through the M.2 SSDs that are out now. They generally consume four PCIe lanes, sometimes by four and sometimes by two. So when you have a setup like that, you're instantly exceeding the lane availability of Haswell and Z87, Z97. With Skylake at 36 lanes, you could have two by 16 video cards and a by four SSD and you'll be consuming all the lanes, but you will be fine and probably won't have to multiplex really at all, or at least not heavily if you do. And then if you're doing a three-way GPU setup, it's again, pretty allowing in that regard because you can do uh, by, by, by four and then you can even have another device or by 16 by, by four, whatever, and you can have another SSD in there and you're not gonna run into the lane issues that you would have on Haswell. So that is a big deal, but it's something that we'll test separately in a very in-depth article and video on the lane scalability of Skylake systems. The final update here is that USB 3.0 has four more native supported ports for Z170. So not a big deal, but that brings it up to 10 from six on Z87, Z97. There are other architectural changes as well, but check out the article for that. And let's just dive straight into the gaming benchmarks here. First of all, this system is our test bench for Skylake. Now to test the other CPUs, we obviously had to use other benches because of the platform difference. So the benches are detailed on the website. There were three used, AMD, the Intel Z97 option, and then the Z170 option here. This is the more interesting one to talk about. This was provided by iBuyPower. It's a full system we'll be reviewing separately, but the CPU in here is an i7-6700K. It's got a Z170 chipset on an ASRock K6 Fatality motherboard, which I think we have another video online discussing that motherboard. And then we've got some memory in here as well. It's got 16 gigabytes of G-Skills new DDR4 memory. So this was provided by iBuyPower and it was our test platform. We do not currently have a 6600K, but that is something I will be investigating in the immediate future. For the GPU, this used a GTX 980 Ti, which is something we used in our 7870K benchmark recently, the A10 APU benchmark. And the reason for using this GPU is because it's our fastest single GPU solution without going to a Titan X. And that means that we're hopefully forcing more of a CPU bottleneck in these benchmarks because we're really desperately trying to avoid a GPU bottleneck when we're looking at CPU performance in games. The rest of the test methodology is described on the website. Let's get to the benchmarks here. This test strictly looks at gaming performance. We'll visit the power, thermals, and overclocking stuff in more detail later. There is almost no measurable gain over Haswell, Devil's Canyon, or even the aging 3570K Ivy Bridge CPU. And that's shown here in most of these games. In Grid, there's a slight gain for Skylake. In The Witcher and actually Shadow of Mordor, there's an interesting disparity where most of the time and any time outside of margin of error, we found that the Haswell chips performed better than Skylake for the, the eight thread model. So why does that happen? Well, it's actually sort of interesting. It's because of the DDR4 memory. So even though we have increased bandwidth for DDR4 and increased capabilities for people like video editors, you do actually lose some ground in latency. And that's because the cast timings of DDR4 are significantly slower than DDR3. This is not really new to memory. This happened when we moved from DDR2 to DDR3 as well, DDR1 to DDR2. Things slow down as bandwidth increases but hopefully you get something that outweighs it. Now, in the case of these tests, the difference between the DDR4 and DDR3 performance is so minor that it is almost immeasurable. We had to run the tests about 10 times in order to collect enough data to be confident that there was in fact a disparity. And that's just, that's how small the difference was. It was one FPS or less on average. And the reason for that is the cast timings on this G-Skill memory. It's about 15 for the slowest timing. And on DDR3, you might be closer to nine. So that's actually a pretty big difference in terms of percentage delta for the millisecond latency. And that's where I believe we're seeing this difference because that will impact IPC and things like that, uh, which some games that are more heavily dependent on memory will exhibit this, this outcome. 
which Shadow of Mordor is one of them, and certainly The Witcher 3 is one of them. Now that's not too critical because the difference again is pretty small, but it's something interesting and fun to talk about, so I wanted to bring that up. Moving on to the other games, you see that for the most part there's really no measurable advantage for Skylake over the recent CPUs all the way down to Ivy Bridge. I do not have a Sandy Bridge CPU for testing, unfortunately. Overclocking was limited, but we have engineering samples, so I'll have to retest this as we update the BIOS, the firmware, things like that, and get it all up to production level BIOS, so hopefully that will increase our overclocking ability. But you can see in this chart the achieved overclocking output in our testing. I was limited to about 4.6 gigahertz on Skylake. Really not super impressive. I, I think it should be more, but I'm skeptical of the pre-production board and CPU. So we'll update these engineering samples and hopefully get some retail samples and then I'll, I'll let you guys know via video and article how it overclocks in the full version. Overall, Skylake is not a bad CPU, just like Haswell was not a bad CPU, Ivy Bridge was not a bad CPU, but none of them are particularly impressive in the face of their immediate predecessor, and that remains true with Skylake. So Skylake, the 6700K, is standalone a good CPU. It does what it should do, it's fast, and there's really not much of a downside against the previous generation, but it's also not a huge advancement in terms of raw gaming performance. So if you are on Sandy Bridge, Ivy Ridge, Haswell, Devil's Canyon, Haswell Refresh, then there's really no reason to jump from same SKU to same SKU on Skylake. There's no reason for you to go from a 2700K to a 6700K, for the most part, if you're just gaming. If you're doing production tasks, then it becomes more desirable because now you've got DDR4 and you have more lanes. And for production heavy systems, that is certainly something that is worth considering. But for gamers, if you're on Haswell, Ivy Bridge, whatever, uh, Sandy Bridge, then jumping to Skylake will not produce a really measurable gain in your gaming performance. You might get a couple of FPS at very best, but the money would likely better be spent on something else, like an SSD or a better GPU or something like that. The thing with Skylake is that it's got DDR4 memory, and that's a hidden cost. So that's the one area where I would advise system builders working on a new computer to either look at a Skylake DDR3 option or some other CPU basically platform. But if DDR4 cost isn't a concern to you, if you think you'll get use out of it, then certainly Skylake is really not a bad implementation of that. X99 is going to be faster if you're using the high-end X99 chip with DDR4 for production tasks because you've got quad channel, you've got uh, the DDR4 memory as this has, and then you've also got the additional lanes of a production class CPU. So for Premiere users, Photoshop users, people like that who are doing this professionally, working with these applications, batch processing all day long, then X99 should still be your go-to if it is within budget. But if you're more of an enthusiast hobbyist, then Skylake is not a bad way to go. So that is all for this Skylake review. Check the article for full details in the description below. And then I'll be back shortly with overclocking with an AMD APU review of the 7870K. It's already published on the website if you want to jump ahead of me and check that out. And then we've got some other fun articles that we're working on as well, especially those with lane scalability and GPUs, which is more of my specialty, as many of you know. So check out our Patreon page if you like this kind of coverage. It really helps us to build that audience on Patreon because we're trying to lessen our dependency on advertisers and traditional advertising. But only if you really like what we're doing here. So check that out, and I will see you all next time.